everybody, Michael Davis here. Welcome to Bone to Pick, and we are coming to you today from Boston, Massachusetts, and the Berklee College of Music. Uh, our featured artist this month is one of the most in demand and respected lead trumpet players uh, on the international jazz scene, the great Tanya Darby. Uh, she is currently the chair of the brass department, and she was kind enough to let us uh, use this wonderful office. And we have a fantastic view of Boston in the background, which you can't see, but you'll have to take our word for it. Um, <laughs> And uh, before joining the faculty here at uh, the Berkeley College, she was the uh, uh, professor of lead trumpet at University of North Texas. Uh, she has toured and recorded and performed with a, a virtual who's who of the jazz world, uh, including a longtime association with the Vanguard Jazz Orchestra, uh, the Roy Hargrove Big Band, the Diva Jazz Orchestra, the Count Basie Orchestra, Mingus Big Band, uh, Clark Terry, Duke Ellington Orchestra, Rufus Reed Large Ensemble, Michelle Camilo, uh, the list goes on, believe me, but I'll uh, leave it at that for right now. That gives you an idea of what uh, the, the level of work that Tanya does. Uh, she had obtained her master's degree from the Rutgers University in New Jersey, got her bachelor's from Manhattan School of Music, and uh, as a, she's active worldwide on a very busy schedule as a guest artist and clinician. And uh, as a proud former Californian, uh, I can say yes. that we share, have a common bond of being uh, no-cal people. She's from the Monterey area, and myself from uh, San Jose area. So, Tanya, thank you for taking time out of your crazy busy schedule to uh, <laughs> spend some time with us well, today. thank you for having me. Let's, yeah. uh, if we can, speak into the Bay Area, let's talk, or, or that area in general, let's talk about uh, what, what your uh, growing up years were like in, in Seaside, California, a beautiful area just north of Monterey, and uh, what got you into the oh. music and the trumpet, et cetera. Yeah, God, well, Monterey, you know, we were, just, we were just talking about just what a beautiful area that, that is. And every time I go home, I, I take for granted, like, just the beauty that we had there. Mm -hmm. You know, just the water was right there. And, you know, my parents are still there, so I try to get back as much as I can to, to visit. But, um, you know, my, um, my start with the trumpet was very accidental. You know, that's okay. a question that I get a lot, too. And yeah. um, when I started middle school, uh, I had band on my schedule, you know, like the little list. You know. <laughs> and I remember thinking, like, I am not doing band. There is no way I'm going to be in the band. So. It's not cool. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm not going to be one of the cool kids. <laughs> so uh, I, I took the schedule to the office to get the principal to sign off on it. But I had to get the actual band director to sign off on it, too. So when I took the slip to her, you know, long story short, she fed me some line about, you know, you've, you've, have you ever thought about playing an instrument? You know, you've got lips for a trumpet, you know. <laughs> so she basically cut me this deal and gave me a trumpet and said, take it home for a week and just, you know, if you, know, if you still want to sure. give it back after the week. <laughs> she knew something I didn't, apparently. You know? So I took this beast home and my parents were none too thrilled <laughs> about right. all the noise going on in the house, but I, I fell in love with it then, you know. Awesome. And um, started playing in the bands there. And one, you know, one of the great things about growing up in Monterey is just the fact that you have the um, Monterey Jazz Festival. Sure, there. yeah. And they're so passionate about education and so caring about students and students' musical development that from early on, you know, like I started going to some of the jazz camps, like the Monterey uh, Jazz Festival camp. I believe that's still going on. I'm not sure, I'm not sure if it's under the same title. Mm -hmm. um, Stanford Jazz Workshop and oh, just right. having, yeah, you know, right. people visit, you know, schools like weekly to, you know, so that was a huge part of my musical development. You yeah. Know? Yeah, that's not awesome. be part of it, you know. Yeah. yeah. Was Next Generation Jazz Orchestra going at that point? Yes. Now, I, know, I know you've yeah. been associated with them from the professor point of view, yeah. but, uh, <laughs> but as a student, was that something yeah, you were, yeah. to so, be involved in? Yeah, then it was called the, the Monterey Jazz Festival All-Star All oh, right, Band. of course. I'm yeah, not yeah. sure when the name changed. Right. But back when I was doing it, it was under the uh, direction of Bill Barry. Oh, you know, wow. Bill okay, Barry. sure, so, sure. He, oh, man. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so and that was a great uh, experience because... You know, once I started to really get serious about jazz and kind of see that as something that I really wanted to passionately pursue, um, having like these opportunities of playing different county bands, um, that band, and what was so cool about that band is they would send the band overseas every summer for mm -hmm. like three weeks. Yeah. So, you know, by the time I'd graduated high school, I'd been to Japan a few times and Europe and Australia. So I look back on those times and really realize just how lucky I was to yeah. really ex experience some of that. So, I mean, how many students come out of high school could say they, you it's know, had, <laughs> yes, I'd been to the Great Barrier <laughs> Reef. <laughs> yes, my, ju my junior year of high school, yeah. Yeah, my, actually, my uh, my youngest son, who's now down at the University of Miami, he was in uh, Next Gen his senior year, and, mm -hmm. and you know, 
Oh, yeah, Dad, I'm up at the Montreal Jazz Festival today. And, uh, yeah, we're playing Toronto Jazz yeah. Festival tomorrow. Like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, some awesome. of the gigs we wish yeah, for yeah, today, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> it was such. A, I mean, it was just an awesome program, and they yeah. played at Dizzy's in, in New York City. It's mm -hmm. awesome. Did you go directly then after ha high school to Manhattan School of Music? I um, did. Okay, I what did. What was that transition like, going from uh, such a beautiful area to New York City, yeah. which is beautiful in its own way, but not uh, <laughs> not aesthetically as beautiful, I would say, as Monterey area. <laughs> yeah, you know, I think I think for me, like I had I had been so uh, excited about the idea of going to New York already, that 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 didn't sort of factor in. You know, okay. um, you know, I just knew that I wanted to be in the epicenter of jazz, and for all I knew, that that's uh, New York was it. You know, mm -hmm. um, and again with the jazz festival um, experience with all the bands, I think I had. Myself and my parents had sort of gotten used to the to the concept of me being uh, away from home. Okay. So when I did leave for college, if anything, they were a little too comfortable with me leaving. You know, <laughs> I remember being, I was at the airport, you know, they're kind of sending me in. I was, I was like, bye, Mom, bye, Dad. They're like, call when you get there. <laughs> I was like, you know, can I get a, a tear, a, a hug, you know, something? Yeah. <laughs> call when you get there. <laughs> But yeah, but so much of those uh, experiences really prepared me for just not being a musician, but just like that huge life transition. I mean, that can be a traumatic thing, you know, leaving home and being so oh, far yeah. away from home yeah, and all yeah. that. But I just had so much support from my family, from my community in mm -hmm. Seaside, you know. Um, yeah, so it was it was it was an easy transition for mm -hmm. me in that sense, I think. And what was your your time at Manhattan like? Uh, I'm I'm guessing that was in the Justin DeChocho era. Oh, yeah, and yeah. And got all that, the positive vibes oh, that he's always putting out. Like, a, yeah. what, what was that time like, and who did you study trumpet-wise? Who were you studying with at that point? Oh, yeah, well, when I start, I did my first two years. My, my first two years, I, I was uh, lucky enough to study with Cecil Bridgewater. Oh, nice, okay. Um, and I met Justin um, my senior year of high school. I did the Grammy band, sure. you know? Um, and that's when I first met Justin, and that energy was just completely infectious. I mean, yeah. I already kind of, I was looking at Manhattan School and wasn't really, because, you know, I was thinking about maybe staying in California, being from California. When I met Justin, it was just like, okay, okay, <laughs> this is what it's bags. about. Yeah, yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, so my first couple years were with uh, Cecil Bridgewater. That was great, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and my second couple of years, my, my second uh, year was with uh, Byron Stripling. Oh, wow, And okay. that was fantastic, too. Yeah, but just having access to, you know, not only the, the faculty there, because at the time, um, Lou Soloff was teaching there, you know, uh -huh. so I had some access with him. Um, wow, like, the question is, who wasn't there, you know? <laughs> Jeez. Um, Manny Album was teaching, ah, uh, arranging right, right. all these, you know, so just being around all of that, positive energy and then just the talent of the students there it was just it was a really exciting time to be there mm -hmm. you know that's really awesome. exciting time to be there that's good to hear that you say byron and i were classmates at eastman way back are when. you serious yeah yes, oh. i've always been a big fan and just followed, oh, followed his uh, incredible career and uh, work he's done over the years uh, you know I, I, I always share with students you know byron was the first one to really to really tell me that I couldn't play the trumpet, you know? <laughs> and it sounds cruel, it's like you know, but there was so much that I that I had sort of just learned naturally and not uh -huh. really had learned, like any of the pedag peda I'm gonna mess this mess up the, the pedagogical yes the pedagogical <laughs> pedagogical <laughs> aspects of uh, brass, you know, and he was you know the one that really kind of sat me down. It's like listen, you know, you really need to start to focus on trumpet playing, not uh -huh. what you, and it really changed my life. Uh -huh. He really he he, he cracked the whip. And, yeah, yeah, we all know Byron is just a yeah. exceptional, exceptional technician yeah, on mean, the instrument. I so. remember hearing him when he was 18 years old and we were freshmen at Eastman and, and, and he just had so much ability. You know, yeah. he had a double A that would take the house uh, down, you know. <laughs> yeah. But then he went through that whole process of understanding, getting, you know, he was already playing at such a super high level, but, you know, just kept getting yeah. better and better. And, uh, for, you know, the, his work ethics, you know, work, part of the yeah. reason why it's carried him professionally, you know, Absolutely. into the, all those things that he's done. Um, who were some of your other, I was curious, like, you're so well known now as, as being an influencer to, to, pe to folks coming up now, but uh, who, did you have some, in addition to, say, Byron, did you have lead trumpet influences out there, or just trumpet influences in general that yeah, you were you know, influenced I, by a lot? To be honest, like, I don't really think my lead trajectory started until after I had gotten to college. Okay. Um, I, I just, I wasn't really 
familiar with so much of that world. I mean, our school had a jazz band, which was and I, I played lead in the jazz band, but um, I didn't really start to be in situations where I really knew what playing lead trumpet was until I started doing some of these honor bands and okay. things like that. Um, and then finding out that that was something that I, that I, I could do. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I wouldn't say that I had um, people that I looked toward for lead trumpet, but I definitely just had just trumpet you have to just geek out on just trumpet players, you know, yeah, yeah, which was great, and and I think um, that me sort of being focused more on like the soloistic side or like being more of a fan of that really spoke to my lead playing because I think a big part of my lead playing that makes me viable is the um, is just the stylistic interpretation mm -hmm. of it, you know, not mm -hmm. just high notes or whatever, but really phrasing like a soloist would, you know. Um, as far as people that I had contact with that I really, that were a huge part of my um, upcoming were definitely Bill Berry, just having yeah. the, the contact with him. Um, I met John Faddis when I was uh, in the um, Monterey Jazz Festival All-Star Band. Oh, very cool. And that was another one, like, <laughs> I met him, I think, when I was 16, and we're still great friends today. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, you meet people along the line that, that you don't realize are going to be just sort of mentors throughout your entire life, and he's definitely been one of those people for me. Mm -hmm. you know? Whether it's a trumpet issue or whether it's just like a life issue, you know. Oh, one thing awesome. about John, he, he'll help you. He'll tell you the truth yeah, about right. yourself <laughs> while he's helping you. Um, but he's been, he's been a huge, huge part of my uh, career. I, I remember when I was doing the Monterey Jazz Festival All-Star Band, um, you know John, he's just he's he's, he's a character. You of know, course. he loves to pick on people. <laughs> loves to pick on people. So we had our uh, audition, and he he said something, you know, and I kind of gave it back to him, you know. And he kind of gave me like, oh, okay, <laughs> you know. And he pulled me up in front of the stage to solo with him during the uh, festival and and all that. Oh, that's great. Um, there was a great trumpet teacher, and I for for the life of me, I cannot think of his name right now. He was a Nor uh, NorCal person too. Um, I'm embarrassed I can't think of his name. Uh, but Paul Contos, who's not a oh, trumpet yeah, player, right, you know, so right, Paul yeah. was one of the, the, the cats that would come around. And, uh, yeah, just, you know, so many, so many people I can think of. Yeah, you know? that's yeah. awesome. Well, you did your master's at Rutgers. Did you do, was there time in between there? Uh, oh, yeah. Just in New York working? And I, I know you've been on the scene in New York for so yeah. many years, so I'm, there was some time in there between, yeah. uh, between what was, what was that like, the, the, transition into professional life in New York and uh, and after after finishing up at MSM then oh yeah and then being the being the oldest person in your master's classes at, at, at <laughs> <laughs> well I tell you I mean I, I, I don't have a master's but I always think it's people who take the time off in between there just get that much yeah. more out of the master's uh, experience yeah you know, yeah it was it was great you know one of the things about um, teaching now I you know <laughs> you never really know where your where your life's going to take you. So when I was in my undergrad, I really didn't have eyes to teach. You know, mm -hmm. it really wasn't on my radar. I remember having like a, a professor ask me once if I had ever thought about teaching and I was like, "No." <laughs> no. Yeah. Um but you know, as you get older and your life starts to just just like little ebbs and flows and however it's it's going to go, I I, I found that teaching, in a way, was something that I was already doing, but just didn't realize it. I think we're all teachers in our own right. Sure. If you're, yeah. if you're uh, adept in any craft, or if you study any craft, you're a teacher right. at, at, at some right. point. And I think it, it really sort of became full circle for me when I started to really get older and look back at these experiences that I had when I was younger and all the, the gifts that were given to me and, and really being serious about trying to give some of that back. You know, and paying mm -hmm. it forward. You mm -hmm. know, because that's the mm -hmm. only way this this thing is going to continue. Totally, you know? totally. Yeah. When I when I went back to get my master's, um, you know, it was just I had sort of started to maybe think about maybe going back to school. <laughs> you know, sort of started thinking about it. And um, uh, th another person that I that I have to give a shout out to is um, Conrad Herwig. Of course, yeah. Because he was <laughs> running, he's, okay. you know, running the the, the pro. And I had reached out to him with just like a random question just you know maybe, maybe I'm kind of thinking kinda about, thinking about you know <laughs> um, and he mentioned something called the a bunch fellowship which is a fellowship that uh, Rutgers offers every few years and it you know one thing led to another I um, applied for this for this fellowship and then I ended up getting it and I was able to go back and get my master's oh that's awesome as, yeah. a, as an adult so that was pretty <laughs> funny you know sitting in the class and I'm not cheating, but looking at the youngins. Oh, yeah, uh, uh, listen, what you got on the, oh, uh, you know. <laughs> uh, listen, what are you doing tonight? Can you come uh, study? 
But it was it was great. It was a it was a great great experience to to that's be back awesome. into that mode yeah. again. You know, yeah. And to see how different how much it had sort of changed. You know, yeah. It changed, but it stays the same. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we had Conrad on the show as a guest a couple years back now, and. Uh, and we did it at Rutgers, actually. And, uh, you know, he's just so passionate about everything he does, oh, you know, yeah. and in the same way that comes across in his playing. And oh, so yeah. So I know as a teacher, he uh, he's fantastic. I mean, he just is just all in all yes. the time. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And that's great for students, you know, to see that yeah. someone's really in it for them. Yeah, yeah, yeah for great. sure, for sure. That's great. Well, let's talk about your, your, your playing career, especially in New York. I mean, your playing mm -hmm. career now is worldwide, but, uh, but your time in New York, I know the – the long time. I mean, I, I certainly associate you so strongly with the Vanguard Jazz Orchestra and, mm. and the work you did with yeah. that incredible band, one of the iconic big bands of all time. But just maybe take us through some of the bands. I mean, your your roster is uh, of uh, uh, people you played with is uh, second to none. So t tell right. us about that. You know, the the varieties of uh, ensembles that you've gotten to play with, oh, and things wow. that have kind of jumped out at you over yeah. the years. You know, I've I've, I've been really really lucky and, and, and really blessed to get some to, to get to play with some great people whenever I speak to that whenever the question comes up you know can we talk about who you've played with I have to talk about the the friends and the relationships that I developed that led me to having opportunity to play with these bands mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. I always tell students like uh, up I'm, I'm sure well over 90 percent of the of, of the gigs that I've got have, have been either through uh, recommendation of someone that I knew or subbing for someone that I knew, mm -hmm. right? So making sure that when you're in this world that you're not just cultivating your craft, but you're cultivating just being a good person mm. or just trying, yeah. you know, because um, no one, A, is going to play with a jerk. Yeah. And B, yeah. you never know who, who's going to recommend you for something or not recommend you for something, you know. Um, playing with the Vanguard Jazz Orchestra is definitely one of the highlights of my life, you know. Mm. I mean, just to be a part of that lineage is, is huge for me. And how that whole thing started was just being um, colleagues with uh, Frank Green, who we all know, okay. just an amazing, amazing trumpet player. Sure. Um, and just all, I mean, you talk about just uh, someone that has an amazing career, you know. Yeah. And, um, and, our, I, and another no-cow guy, by the way. That's right, yeah, yeah. There's something about the no-cow water, you know. Um, and I can't remember when I first met Frank, but, you know, but he's always been one of those people that I just, I've just i seen and I've loved to hear and whatnot, and we've gotten to work together with some other bands, like Royal Hargrove's band and mm. things like that. Um, and he, he called me to start subbing for him on the Vanguard band. Um, and that turned into pretty much a regular thing. And then when he moved on, I was able to move into that um, position. Mm -hmm which was great, you know. Um, and as far as some of the other bands, it's like a lot of the same sort of um, connections, you know. Uh, as far as playing with the Basie band, that was just from knowing um, Scotty Barnhart and uh, some of the people in the, in the band before. Um, being good friends with Dennis McCrell, uh -huh, um, when, he sure. was, when, when he, he was running the band. I actually teach with Dennis at a camp in the summer. Okay. Um, so I'm sure that some of those um, connections led to me playing with the band. So, um, yeah, it's like when I think back on all these amazing, amazing opportunities. Some of the first, like, pro gigs I had were um, Byron sending me on gigs. Okay. I remember, oh, I remember, <laughs> I can't remember what year, but I, I remember vividly I was sitting in this, there was this, there was this place in a, I think it was like on 70-something, uh, okay. Atomic Wings. Oh, yeah, I, yeah, sure, know, I, yeah, yeah. I, I liked my wings. Oh, right? I'm with you on that. Yeah, yeah. I'm sitting in there with, with a friend, and the phone rings, and it's uh, Byron, right? So I was like, oh, man, I must have missed a lesson or something. <laughs> like, I mean, you know, when Byron calls, something, mm -hmm. you know, something was going drastically <laughs> wrong. So I was, like, I was like, hello? And he's like, Tanya, listen, I need you to do, do a gig for me. Can you do this gig? And I was like, okay. And it was with um, Aretha Franklin. Okay. And I was like, uh, okay. <laughs> so first of all, so but but what really freaked me out wasn't the fact that I was going to be playing with her. It was the fact that I was going to be subbing Sorry for, for him, <laughs> you know. So just those things and just sort of being in the right place at the right time, um, being open to like opportunities that were given to me really led to some amazing mm -hmm. relationships in my life, which mm -hmm. which led to gigs, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so I try to nourish that. I'm trying to think who else. Greg Gisbert has always been a really big, uh, just a big part of my life too. I remember being a, I think I was, I was probably still fairly new in New York and I was playing with Diva doing something. And uh, 
I remember hearing, some, like, I played a high G or something, I hear somebody go, oh my God, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and, it, you know, and it was Greg, and Greg has just been a huge advocate and just uh -huh. a great, you know, a great, you know, I think he had a beard back then, you know, he had, yeah, the, yeah. He had the gizzy beard, you know. <laughs> um, so yeah, Vanguard yep. Band, Diva Band, you know, Roy Hargrove. Now he's one, he's one of those guys that I definitely idolized when I was younger. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was in, my, I, I would go see him play at um, Kumumba. Oh yeah, Kumumba, sure, sure. Every time yeah, the band yeah, was yeah. a town, I would, I, would, I would track up there. And, and just that voice, you know, just yeah. I'm still kind of grappling with the fact that that voice is, that voice is gone, but it's yeah. still here and it will always be here. Yeah, you know? yeah, absolutely. You know, and I'm eternally grateful just for that influence. Yeah. And then getting, you know, going from being this kid in the audience seat on stage to getting to share the stage with him was, that was huge. Yeah, huge. that's awesome. Well, you know, you, you gave us like amazing advice right there without meaning as advice, just talking about your story is like, Nobody wants to play with somebody who's a drag to be around. Exactly. And, and you've always been the polar opposite of the bat, that. It's like get Tanya on the gig because it's just a groove in, in addition to playing great. But it's such an important, and I'm sure your students picked that up uh, here at Berkeley. It's That's real, rule number one, you know, yeah. and then, then playing, you know, also right. 1A, you know. <laughs> but, <No. laughs> but let's uh, let's jump over to the kind of the education side of things. And before we talk about Berkeley, this before this you were, you were down at the – University of North Texas, yeah. one of the, also one of the great, obviously one of the great programs for, for many decades now. What was that experience like for you, uh, teaching down there? Oh, it was there? great. It was mm -hmm. great. You know, when I, when I moved down to, when I moved down to Texas, I had been in, I did the math, and I'd, I'd, I'd been, the, been in New York for just over 20 years, or like 21 okay. years, and I couldn't, Good. I was like, man, I, A, I'm getting <laughs> old. B, it's like, what the hell am I doing, you know? And, uh, Moving down to Texas, like it was like one of those sort of life uh, events where you just kind of figure it's like, well, I'm not really sure what the next chapter of my life is going to be, so let me just kind of go and just yeah. experience. And it was great, you know. Um, my oldest sister lives in Fort Worth. Oh, okay. So it was okay. great to kind of go oh, down nice. uh, and be near family again. Uh -huh. One of the great things about being down there is um, I had always, I didn't go to North Texas, but if you are a musician, you have some sort of connection with North Texas, <laughs> yeah. whether it's the people you know, yeah. the, pe the gigs you have, the, the, the people you hang with. So getting to really see that familial connection down there with not only current students, but um, alumni and mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. the sheer number mm -hmm. of trumpet players, it's kind of frightening, yeah. you know. <laughs> you kind of get sick of hearing trumpet, you know, yeah. by the end of the week, it's like, oh God, can I just get like an oboe going <laughs> at some point, you know. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, you know, I mean, even though it was, you know, sort of short, I was down there for th uh, three and a half years, it was great, okay. and then this opportunity came up. Okay. You know, I met some great friends, great colleagues, great students, um, and it was an, an honor to be part of that lineage, yeah. you know, not as a student, but as a faculty member there. You know. How many big bands do they have there now? Nine. It's nine, okay. Nine. And is it still, this nine the nine o'clock band is still meets at nine o'clock, or is it uh, not quite that? Nine o'clock, it, it took me so long to wrap my head around this. <laughs> nine o'clock band meets at, I think, seven. Okay. So there's a couple of bands that meet at the same time. So oh, okay. the latest band meets at seven. Okay. You know? um, but yeah, and what's great about that, you know, you have people that are uh, jazz majors, not jazz majors, having like opportunities to have, um, uh, large group uh, mm -hmm. experience, mm -hmm. um, grad, grad students having the uh, opportunity to lead bands, mm -hmm. lab bands, which is sort of a uh, unique yeah. thing there. So yeah, it was, it was a great, we had a great time. It was a, little, cool. it was a little hot, <laughs> a little hot. It was, uh, it was uh, yeah, late, uh, late September days. Uh, little, uh, <laughs> I knew I was in trouble when I, I went to the grocery store at like eight in the morning and it was packed. <laughs> I was like, why is it so crowded? And then I realized, oh, everyone grocery shops in the morning in the summer because that's the only, yeah. that's the safest time to do it's so. It's crazy, yeah. Without, you know, dying of acute heat stroke. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know you're in your, your first semester here at Berkeley. Right. You're the chair of the brass department, obviously a coveted position, and you're mm. following the great Sean Jones. Yes. And that, yeah. um, great stuff. So tell us, uh, tell us how things are working out for you here and, and, right. and what's going on here with the program and where things might be headed and oh, uh, it's, all it's, of the above. It's been great. It's been exciting. It's been a uh, whirlwind. I just started in uh, January, so made the move up here. Moving to Boston in, in the winter was uh, okay. very interesting, yeah. you know. <laughs> um, but Berkeley's one of those schools that, that I've always been a fan of. It's, it's, it's always been on my radar. One of the great things about Berkeley, it's, it's always just on the cutting edge of everything, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and I've always been a, a real advocate for, as, as, as far as how I teach or my um, approach to, to, to teaching is sort of like a whole 
experience. Um, you know, uh, encouraging students to be the most versatile players that they can, not just in their in their specific instrumental field, but all the fields around that. You know, how can you be um, a well-rounded player with different skill sets? And that's something that I think we're we're in an uh, exciting time now, as far as um, technology goes, as far as ways to um, integrate that into your uh, careers. Mm -hmm. It used to be something that was just kind of fun that you could kind of do on the side, as, you know, but now it's, it's almost expected, you know, that you have some sort of audio engineering um, abilities, some um, abilities with DAWs or, mm -hmm. you know, programs or things like that. Um, audio visual, you know, now you're your own manager and your own PR person and things like that. Right, so, yeah. And I can't think of a better place to get that well-rounded uh, education than, than, than here at Berkeley. Mm -hmm. um, it's great because it's not only something that's a, a possibility here, but it's encouraged, you know. Okay. One of the things that I really <coughs> love about it here is that, you know, we sort of help, help students find their path, you know. Not necessarily what the um, subscribed path is for your, for your instrument. You know, you play the trumpet, you're going to play leader section, you're going to get a gig, you're going to get a big band <laughs> gig, and then you're gone. There aren't really many gig ba uh, big band gigs left. Right. right. So what are you going to do? Yeah. You know, other than, than just play. You know, how can you supplement that? And just really giving students to, uh, freedom to explore some of those options, to find what speaks to them, and to really help them attain those goals for themselves. And that's, that's a real... I, th I think that that's where the future is, mm -hmm. as far as this craft goes. To keep things alive and to keep things moving forward, we have to grow with it and mm -hmm. change with it. And I think Berkeley's been great at just sort of setting the bar for that mm -hmm. type of educational experience. You know. Yeah, that's yeah. that's terrific. Well, they were smart to uh, enlist your talents to to run this uh, end of the program. It's it's great, and the fact that you have that outlook, I think. Uh, I know um, when I look back on it many years ago now, but being in school and, you know, uh, not so much from the technology side, but mm -hmm. from the actual s stylistic playing side, that's what I got a lot out of was, right. okay, I'm playing in the symphony orchestra this afternoon, tonight's jazz ensemble, and tomorrow's my brass quintet, and then, you know, and I know you have all very similar experiences. Yeah. And now kind of modernizing that thought process, like you, you described, being able to record yourself or, you right. know, all these different s skill sets that, you know, Back when I was in school, that didn't even, that pro it probably existed here at Berkeley, but most places it didn't. And mm -hmm. now you're starting to see that become, uh, you know, encouraged certainly, and, and sometimes it's required at certain uh, schools, you know, which is, yeah. I think is a, is a great thing. You yeah. know? Um, I wanted to ask you about your experiences as a woman in the field of brass and jazz. Right. And I think um, I'm just super encouraged to see what's happening. You know, we're just seeing more women all the time in New York now, mm -hmm. and great players, yeah. you know, you know, just fantastic, and and it's just a much healthier environment. And and what has that process been like for you over the years? As right. you said, you spent twenty years in New York, and and yeah. I'm sure you had uh, experiences that were not always favorable f for you, despite the fact that they should have been. But uh, mm -hmm. but now it seems like things are on a much more positive trajectory. And I was wondering just your thoughts and outlook on things yeah. as, a, as a woman. You know, when I, it's, um, it's, 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 it's so funny because I j just did this sort of like town hall meeting with um, some of the uh, Global Institute jazz students where we sort of talk about gender and jazz. Um, okay. I don't know if you know that um, Terry Lynn Carrington started a uh, uh, jazz and gender institute here at Berkeley. Oh, I didn't know that. She's been fantastic yeah. and doing a lot of, a lot wow. of great things. that's amazing, yeah. Speaking to this very topic, you know. And if we're talking about like exciting times, I think we are in very exciting times when it comes to gender and uh -huh. not just jazz, but gender and um, music. Obviously, because of our fields, we're going to focus in, in uh, jazz. Um, when you think about some of the changes that are already happening right now, it's very exciting. Um, we also have to think about some of the some of the awkward and painful conversations that had to happen for us to get to this place, mm -hmm. you know, and really understanding that. Um, women in the field have really stepped up to, to put themselves in a very vulnerable position to tell the truth about what's been going on and to sort of put eyes and ears and light to some of these situations. Mm -hmm. And I think it's great because it's an opportunity for all of us to grow, 
to actually recognize what the real problem is and to work on healing as a family, mm -hmm. you know, not sort of assigning blame to individual parties or like individual sexes, individual groups, but here's the issue, what are we gonna do to get to where we wanna be? And we're taking those steps to get there. And I think what's encouraging for me is to see that people are more and more unafraid to go through the scary part of that, mm. you know, which is acknowledging some of the ignorance, um, yeah. uh, acknowledging some of the um, um, inequity that's been plaguing this uh, field for so long. You know, I think I've been really lucky that I haven't personally um, experienced um, a lot of outright sexism mm -hmm. um, or a lot of outright just gender biased issues or, or things like that. But that, that, that does not mean that I'm not responsible to speak um, not on behalf of women, I can only tell my story, mm -hmm. but to be part of that change, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, those are some of those moments where you kind of look at what you're doing, like what your purpose is here, you know. And we've had great careers and, you know, and we get to do really, really cool things and all that stuff. So now the question is, okay, what are we gonna do with the gifts that we've been afforded, you know. Mm -hmm. So now that I'm in this, um, a position, not just here, but you know, other schools and, and things like that. Um, obviously, keep playing. You know, that's what I do. Um, but keep trying to move forward in all of these areas. You know, mm -hmm. um, and to pay homage, you know, to the women that have paved the way for us before. You know, because without Mary Lou Williams and Clara, Clara Bryan, Sweetheart to Rhythm, and all those women, I wouldn't be here today. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. know, and to be part of that part of that continuum today carving that path out for the women to follow after me, that's, that's a real honor. And that's mm. something that I'll, I try not to take for granted mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow, really well said. Uh, thank you. Uh, no, thank you I, for the question. Yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, your outlook on it is so positive and just yeah, it's a responsibility factor and yeah, all of it is just terrific. So yeah. thank you. Um, I have to ask this, and I know that brass players, like, I get these emails all the time, like, mm -hmm. make sure you ask what kind of horn she's playing, what mouth she's playing. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure you're thinking, like, after, like, such an eloquently stated <laughs> answer to the question, like, it's like really? Ooh, That's ooh. what you're going to ask next? <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to ask it anyway. Like, tell us about what you're playing on these days <laughs> and uh, equipment-wise, what's going on for Tommy <laughs> Garvey. That's <laughs> so funny. Like, I have, it's so, because, you know, I, I try not to be a geek. I'm so not, like, an equipment geek. <laughs> And so it's like I, I have this rule, like if, if a student kind of keeps coming, oh yeah, I found the mouthpiece. It's like okay, let's, you, you change the mouthpiece, you're on that mouthpiece for the yeah. for the rest of the semester, yeah, right? Yeah. But as soon as they leave my office, I'm like, okay, so that was a that was a that was a great black. That was kind of tight. That sounded good. You know? So I'm like, you know. Um, it's easy to fall in that <laughs> rabbit hole, boy. <laughs> oh my God, yeah. Um, yeah, you know, I've, I've I've never been a horn junkie. You okay. know, um, I try to go for like whatever I think feels more comfortable for me. It was um, important for me to sort of um, not base what I played based on what everyone else around me played, because it's really easy to see. Okay, this cat's playing this, so that's what I'm going to play to get that sound. You know, right. understanding that we're all just um, physiologically different. We all have different ways of getting sound on different instruments. Um, that's where I sort of started to get curious about not necessarily having to fit the mold, you know. Mm -hmm. Even though I, I do play like a lot of lead, I, I tend to play, I, I definitely uh, lean more towards l large bore trumpets. Okay. Um, and a big throat, a mouthpiece. Um, I've been um, associated with, with Edwards for years. Okay, I, I, yeah, I have that's a, what I thought you were. Yeah, a, a great Edwards trumpet. But now uh, with uh, Yamaha, I'm on a, a large bore Zeno. Okay. Um, for like the past, I think like the past couple, like maybe year and a half, um, that's had some tweaks. Some, and <laughs> when I say tweaks, you, you talk about being in the right place at the right time. I'm at, I'm at NEC and um, no, no, I was actually at Gen and there was something going on with, you know, trumpet players. I was like, oh man, you know, my sounds is stuffy, you know, it's, it's gotta be the horn, you know. <laughs> so I called Wayne uh -huh. um, Tanabe. Okay, know. yeah. And he was going to be at uh, Jen in Dallas. So he was like, well, hey, bring your horn. I'll kind of do some tweaking or whatever. So he does some tweaks. And I get the horn back to my room, and it just it's like 10 times worse than what it was oh. before. <laughs> like, whatever <laughs> happened, I was like, uh, Wayne? Uh, Wayne? And of course, all this is in my head. There's nothing wrong with it, you know. So a couple weeks later was um, NTC, and I... I had to leave the day before NTC started, but okay. Wayne was going to be there. 
So Wayne was like, listen, I'll come to your office and we'll tweak the horn. It just so happened that Bob Malone was coming in that day too. So both Wayne and Bob are in my office, like, you know, <laughs> tweaking my horn and everything, you know. So I don't know what the hell they did. I don't know if some kind of holy water mojo or something. But that thing, and it's, you know, it's, it's, been, it's been great. You know, I, I like a horn that's versatile, that's open, that I have um, a lot of control over how I want to sound. You know, mm -hmm. if I really need to kind of, you know, peel paint, I have that. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, if I need to try to sound pretty at some point, I can, I, I, I <laughs> excuse me, I have that. Um, as far as mouthpieces go, um, this, how long do you have? No. <laughs> um, Pickett has made several custom okay. uh, mouthpieces for me that are, that are great. Uh -huh. They don't know this yet, but the latest Frankenstein that I'm going to send them to make is basically uh, a... Uh, Reeves, so it's a it's a 43, 43N rim with a 43 uh, shank, but with but with the throat opened up to like a 25. Okay. So I'll send that to to Peter and just be like, listen, do something, <laughs> and then they'll send it back and it'll be magic and it's it'll sound fast and fantastic, you know. <laughs> but as far as lead, like I tend to lean more towards a, a slightly shallower cut, but with a bigger throat. I okay. like the openness of a bigger throat, you know. Mm -hmm. And it's got its pluses and minuses, but everyone sort of finds that balance for mm -hmm. them, you know. And you know, one one thing about teaching is like you know you find out about the latest stuff and yeah. the students come in with the newfangled thing. It's like, ooh, I didn't know they made that, <laughs> and you know, three hundred bucks later, you know. <laughs> um, but the, that's what's happening right now at this moment, as uh, far as what I'm playing. Yeah, yeah, yeah very cool. Uh, yeah, it's a different world now, man. I remember, uh, I remember as a youngster, like you know, driving up to Best Music in Oakland, and you know, oh, like, you know it's fifty bucks for the most expensive <laughs> mouthpiece. You know, now it's just like, is it anything under fifty dollars? <laughs> but the quality is much higher now. I think oh, yeah. too. You know, you're getting just like, oh, yeah. the craftsmanship. Uh, every yeah. time, you know, both from the horn perspective and the and uh, yeah. the mouthpiece perspective. And there's so many great horn makers out there too. It's yeah, like, you know. Yeah, it's it's, it's tremendous. Yeah. I just want to give a special shout out to our mutual buddy Nick Marchion, who uh, oh who, yeah, who uh, has a lot to do with like me learning about your playing, and then he's oh, always been wow. such a huge fan of yours. And, oh and, uh, wow! And always, uh, and, you know, oh you got to check Tanya out on this. And, and, and so uh, it's, it's we had Nick, <laughs> we had Nick on uh, on the show about a year ago, and. Uh, he was very entertaining, as he always oh, yes. is. Oh, it's yes. impossible so not to we've be. We've all <laughs> seen the uh, Cha videos. We've all the seen the Cha videos. But what's, what's funny is like standing next to that and hearing the Cha <laughs> in action. And I don't know how you can perfect. You'd be like playing a Broadway show with him, and you hear this, bop, 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 and then there's a Cha, but he perfectly just tucks it in to where only the right people can yeah. notice it. You know? <laughs> so that, yeah, he's that's a skill. The last, uh, the last show I did, I, I won't name names right now, but the... Uh, the conductor came up and said, uh, Nick was in playing, filling in for somebody, and uh, he came up, the conductor said, I, I think there's a name for that. It's like chawing or something <laughs> like that. The conductor and they, said uh, yeah. <laughs> And they said, yeah, we're not going to have that. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, Nick is just like, what? Why wouldn't you have that? I mean, well, this is like I, adding so I, much. That's what I do. I mean, you know. I just love like the fact that it's gotten it's permeated to the conductor level where they now they notice <laughs> chiming. Ah! <laughs> so it's a oh thing, yeah, give him my love. I, I, talk I to absolutely him in a will. But Tanya, this has been so awesome, and I know oh, your, your you. schedule is crazy. I liked, especially with somebody who's such a passionate educator and gives so much to to students every day. Uh, I like to kind of finish up by just asking your you know, if you if you run across a young person who's interested in coming to Berkeley, and you guys would be interested in having them, and not, it can be much more much wider than that in terms mm -hmm. of uh, the globalness of the answer. But what's your advice to somebody who wants to be the next Tanya Darby and, and run a <laughs> run a major <laughs> department at a major university and play Get on a world job. class level? Get line. another <laughs> job. Get another job. Get another job. You know, my, my answer to that always changes, but I think what I seem to be coming full coming full circle to, it's funny I use the term full circle, <laughs> is that just like in, encouraging students to, when you start to play and when this starts to get serious for you, because you know, there's a point where it's fun and then your parents decide to spend money on college or you've got to pay your first rent check by this, but it yeah. becomes serious, right? Yeah. But never hold on to what, what what got you excited about this in the first place. Mm -hmm. Because at some point in our careers, we always come full circle to that point.
Right. And we sometimes we struggle to get back to that. It's like, man, why am I, you know, because it gets real sometimes, you know. <laughs> sure Especially, you know, you live yeah, in yeah. check to check or whatever. And it's like, you know, and if there's, whether it's jazz, whether it's some other genre of music, whether it's a piece of literature or something that you can always draw to that's going to bring you back to that place of this is, this is why this feels good for me. Mm -hmm. And that you can run off of for years mm -hmm. and decades to come, you know, so never lose side of that because I, I, it's it's hard you know you start cooking. for me i remember when i went to college and i'm getting like introduced to all these i remember the first time someone played booker little for me like blew my mind you know and <laughs> here i am i'm like this lead player and i'm like obsessed with booker little you know <laughs> and just all this different music and stuff and i started to kind of question the music i grew up with i grew up with r&b and hip-hop and soul and i was kind of like well maybe i shouldn't be checking, you know, maybe that's going to sort of dumb down <laughs> my jazz, you know. I guarantee you, after juries, when we're listening to all these juries, when I get in my car, it's yeah. going to be something funky, yeah. it's going to be something bumping. <laughs> I've had many students, like, see me drive by, like, is that Professor Darby? Just bumping, <laughs> you know, because that's my DNA. That's, that's where awesome. I come from. Yeah. And that's that's what comes out in my jazz playing, yeah. you know. So to deny that is to just deny your roots and we yeah. all know you, you, you can't deny where you're coming from yeah you can't deny where you come from yeah uh, well said again well said that's so so important yeah and you and you can just keep coming back to that that w what made you passionate about it it's yes. just like always there just every once in a while remind yourself of it and yeah Mm -hmm. And and I love the fact that you hear the trombone in the background like we're on the brass floor here oh, yeah. at Berkeley. So <laughs> let's just make sure we're all clear on that. <laughs> yeah, there's a brass in the uh, my vocal floor, so you hear some really cool so stuff. So you, you got it all going on. Tanya, really this cool has been awesome. Thank you thank so you, much. Thank you so much for your time. Oh, and, thank uh, you. It's been a pleasure. Check out Tanya on uh, her website and all the great work she's doing here at the brass department at Berkeley College of Music. And we will see all of you next time on Bone to Pick. All right. Thanks. <laughs>